<laughs> and uh, from that point on, when I left the crew, I became a command pilot. What is a command pilot? <clears throat> He's a glorified radio operator. He's charged with assembling the group, rendezvousing with the other groups, with the wings, with the division, with the fighter planes. He had to decide if the, we didn't have a radar at first, pathfinders. We had to decide if the primary target was closed to go to the secondary target. If the secondary target was closed up, what to do with the bombs? That's an important thing. Bring the bombs back, drop it in the channel. I had an aversion to that. I hear we were exposing people to danger. I didn't want to bring my bombs back. I wanted to use them. And on one occasion, we were covered by, by clouds. We were above the clouds, couldn't see anything. I saw a break in the clouds, came down, brought the group slowly down. Right up ahead, I could see a huge structure. I told the bombardier to get ready, told the group to get ready. They opened their bomb bays, and we blasted this thing. It was a huge explosion. I don't know what we hit. I frankly don't know where we were. <laughs> and, and we got back, and uh, Red Bowman, our <clears throat> intelligent man, came up to me and said, Rosie, I think you hit a fertilizer factory. But he didn't use the term fertilizer. It was some, <laughs> <clears throat> and so we continued to fly. And then came D-Day. It was reported to me that the COs of the various groups came before Curtis LeMay the night before, and they told him about D-Day the next morning. And Curtis LeMay dramatically said, I don't give a damn if we lose every single plane. We're going to make this mission a success. We're going to make D-Day a success. Well, he didn't want to lose his planes, I know, but he was making a point. And the next morning, I briefed. I had part of the briefing. And I never seen such reaction from the crews. They stood up and they roared and they cheered. This was the day they were looking for. It was a very dramatic moment. And I led the group on the third mission that day <clears throat> toward desk. <clears throat> and we flew over the vast armada of Allied ships. There were over 5,000 ships below. It was a dramatic sight. And we had a rule that nobody could talk on Intercom unless it was absolutely necessary, radio discipline. And one of the men in the plane started a prayer for the people below, and we all joined in. That was a dramatic day. Now, <clears throat> we continued to fly, and uh, on, I think it was September, 44, I was leading the group over, over Nuremberg, and uh, all three engines, three of our engines were, were hit. We had trouble with them. We finally managed to get over France. <coughs> three engines conked out, <coughs> and uh, we crash landed. There was a stream up ahead, and the, the farther bank was higher than the, the nearer bank and hit the the nose of the, of the plane. All four officers were badly hurt. None of the enlisted men were hurt. And I could remember vaguely hearing some French voices, and I conked out. I was out. And I woke up in a, in a hospital in Oxford, England, where I remained for five weeks. I had very serious injuries to my head and my face, inside my mouth. My arm was broken. My, I had an open wound on my leg. And uh, <clears throat> I, I want to interject uh, that the morning of that mission, I came down to the flight line without a hat. And my CO looked at me and said, Rosie, you're out of uniform. Where's your hat? I said, somebody stuck, took my hat at the officers' club last night. And with that, he took off his old line hat with a stiff brim. We used to wear these four-engine hats. You remember that, bud. And he said, Rosie, this is my lucky hat. Nothing will happen to you. Oh, shit. <laughs> so 
while in the hospital, I looked up and I saw Jeff, our commanding officer, and other people in the 100th coming toward me, carrying a lot of things. I said, oh my God, he's come for his hat. <laughs> but he, he was wonderful. He never mentioned the hat. He had brought gallons of ice cream to me. Apparently, our PX officer must have traded one of our Jeeps to the Navy for an ice cream machine. Those things went on at that time. And I was the hero of the hospital because I doled out ice cream. Well, I, I left the hospital and I came back and I couldn't fly. I was weak. My arm was in a sling. I had this open wound. And they sent me off to wing as operations officer. And I didn't like it. I was there for three weeks and I was griping a little. And General Hugmans finally acceded to my request that I go back to the to the 100th bomb group, and I became CO of the 418th. 